And we're live. Uh, welcome everybody to our third I Am Journal Club. Today we have a topic that might be of special interest to many of you, as well as a fantastic speaker who, a speaker who I will introduce in a second. So here you see two therapies that Dr. Robert Walker, one on hospice at UCSF provided to his wife when she had COVID, muscle ball soup and Paxlovid. So our topic is rotonavir boosted nirmatrelvi or Paxlovid, and the study uh, will examine how effective it prevents, it is at preventing severe COVID-19 in COVID positive patients at an increased, increased risk for severe disease. Our speaker is Dr. Warren Chuang. Uh, Dr. Chuang is a hospitalist, so uh, for those not in the a general internet providing care for hospitalized patients at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is one of my dear HMU colleagues, and if I may say a personal friend, he attended Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Boston University School of Medicine, and then trained at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Chuan has the rank of physician at MGH, and he's the director of staffing at HMU and an assistant uh, professor at Harvard Medical School. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Chuan. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ben. Um, I am very pleased to talk today about a very fascinating paper as well as a fascinating topic to me, which is um, the usefulness of this oral antiviral medication, Paxlovid. Um, why don't we get started and start looking at my slides? And so just um, to explain the meaning of my talk, um, Pax Romana is the Roman peace that lasted for 200 years after the civil uh, war that uh, began with Caesar's rebellion and then continued with Augustus and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Um, and, it was, and it was a period of unusual peace in the Roman Empire, uh, something that historians remember as being um, a longstanding era of peace as well as progress. So in talking about Paxlovid, I think it is important for us to understand uh, Paxlovid in the context of our overall strategy for how we were going to address COVID. And as we all know, the main strategy for the the way that we had tried to address COVID was to create a vaccine that would hopefully prevent infection from COVID. And then the secondary hope was that for those people who did get infection, we hope to find something that would um, allow us to provide them with early treatment to prevent hospitalization. And so this is a table that shows the various options that are currently available uh, for early treatment to prevent hospitalization. And so the first, um, the first medication is nermotrelvir retinavir, also known as Paxlovid. The mechanism of action is that it is a protease inhibitor combination. And the research that has been done is that this medication was actually identified in July of 2020 and then subsequently, the EPIC HR group uh, did a randomized controlled trial demonstrating its efficacy in uh, a high risk population, and it is the talk that we will have today. The other options I think are important to briefly discuss. So, remdesivir is something that hopefully we are all extremely familiar with. The mechanism of action is it is a nucleoside analog that blocks viral RNA production. Um, interestingly, this was identified actually back in 2017 um, as an agent to potentially use against the original SARS-CoV virus. And then, of course, this medication has been subsequently validated in multiple randomized controlled trials in different contexts, but probably the most recent was the pine tree trial that demonstrated its utility uh, in non-hospitalized patients who we would like to treat for um, mild to moderate 
COVID infection. And then the other options are sotruvimab. Um, this is a monoclonal antibody that binds to the viral spike protein. Um, this was a candidate that was identified back, I think, in August of 2020. Uh, this was subsequently then validated in the Comet ICE trial in October 2020. I love the name Comet ICE. Um, and then the last um, medication is molnupiravir, also known as Ligravio. I think it's much easier to say Ligravio. Uh, but this is also a nucleoside analog that promotes mutations in replication of viral RNA. Um, this was identified for SARS-CoV-2 use in March of 2020, and then subsequently studied further in uh, cl in clinical trials in the MOVE-OUT trial in December of 2021. So let's talk more about nermotrelvir. So nermotrelvir is a medication that has been studied by Pfizer. They had actually been looking at several small molecule drugs all the way back in July of 2020. Um, this medication was identified at first as a potential candidate, which they called 00, a PF00835231. Um, it was a candidate drug that they had already been interested in because of its potential use in the original SARS-CoV virus. This drug was then subsequently modified to improve its bioavailability. So in the modified form, also known as PF, 0732132, um, now called nermotrelvir, the bioavailability of this drug was significantly enhanced. And so it now has 50% bioavailability as well as 95% gut absorption, which clearly enhances its utility as an oral medication. The mechanism of nermotrelvir, I think is important to understand Neurotrelvir binds to the active site of the SARS-CoV-2 protease called 3CL or MPRO. Um, this protease is important in the viral life cycle in that the protease is required to um, cleave the polypeptides that then form the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And I think importantly, one thing to understand is we theorize that the active site that neurotrelvir binds to is highly conserved across all coronaviruses. And so it is unlikely to undergo mutation. I think another important thing to understand about the mechanism for neurotrelvir is that the 3CL protease does not have a human analog. And therefore, interactions from nermotrelvir with human proteins is unlikely, as well as the implication further that side effects from nermotrelvir should be unlikely. So Paxlovid is actually a combination of two protease inhibitors. One of them is nermotrelvir, which we had talked about. The other one we probably are also familiar with this medication is ritinavir. And so the reason why Paxlovid was created in this combination was because of the metabolism of nermotrelvir. So nermotrelvir is a substrate of the cytochrome P450 system, more, more specifically of the cytochrome P453A4 protein. Um, it is significantly metabolized by the cytochrome and in its native form, it has a very short duration of action. And thus, retinavir, which is a potent P453A4 inhibitor, was added to Paxlovid. And essentially, this combination inhibits the breakdown of nermotrelvir. It allows lower doses of nermotrelvir to be used. And ultimately, it leads to a longer duration of action of nermotrelvir. And it basically allows us to use Paxlovid in a twice per day or VIP dosing. 
Um, we're going to save questions till the end, unfortunately, but I, I will definitely remember to. Question. I'm sorry. Is it possible to minimize? Oh yeah, sure. I just wanted to be able to be sorry. Thanks for pointing. Thank that you. Out. Sorry, thank you. So what has the research been on Mervatrel here? Um, I think this is a, a useful slide to just summarize what we have done so far in our understanding of Nermatrel beer. Um, so there have been several in vitro studies of Nermatrel beer and SARS-CoV. There's been one in vitro in vivo study. And then um, subsequently there is one randomized controlled trial, which is the EPIC HR trial that we're going to talk about today. Um, I will say for the in vitro studies, one thing that I would point out that is pretty important is um, the, one of the more recent studies in antiviral research has shown that nermatrelvir re retains its activity against the SARS-CoV Omicron variants, which is consistent with our theory that its mechanism of action against the active site for the protease should be conserved across variants. And so, this leads us to what we'll talk about today, which is the paper that was published in the New England Journal by the EPIC HR group. Um, EPIC, I think the EPIC HR um, title is important, especially because the HR means high risk. And that is basically the population of patients that were studied in this trial. And so this slide basically briefly summarizes the important points of the trial, which we'll talk about in greater detail. So this was a multi-centered, multinational, randomized placebo-controlled trial enrolling 2,246 uh, 2, patients. Um, it's important to understand that this trial looked at unvaccinated outpatients with at least one risk factor for progression to severe disease. Um, patients had to have symptoms and they had to be SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive. The endpoints for this were uh, COVID-19 related hospitalizations or any deaths. And the primary analysis were patients who had symptoms within three days. Uh, a secondary analysis was, analysis was also done for patients who had symptoms within five days. And the results were very promising. Essentially, it showed that um, in the Paxlovid group, there was a reduction in, in uh, hospitalizations as well as deaths. There were no deaths in the Paxlovid group um, compared to the placebo group, where there were 6.45 events and there were nine deaths. So the relative risk reduction was 89%. Um, importantly, the, this was a phase two and three trial, so they were also looking at the side effect profile for Paxlovid, and it consistent with its high selectivity for the SARS-CoV-2 protease, the side effects with Paxlovid compared to placebo were very similar. So let's talk about the details of the paper, which I think are really interesting. And I think one important detail to remember is who the EPIC HR group is. And so this paper was completely funded by Pfizer. All of the lead authors were from Pfizer. It is an important thing to keep in mind. I think another important thing to pay attention to in this trial is to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And so patients were included in this trial who were unvaccinated outpatients only. Um, patients that were included were patients who had to have a risk factor for severe disease, including age greater than 60, BMI greater than 25, cigarette smoking, immunosuppression, um, hypertension, diabetes, um, medically complex conditions. Importantly, there were several groups of patients that were excluded, patients with significant liver failure, renal failure, active infection, active HIV, 
and especially important co-administration of medications that were dependent upon the CYP384 cytochrome. Also important to keep in mind, they excluded outpatients who were anticipated to be hospitalized in 48 hours. Uh, they initially excluded patients who were candidates for MABs, but these patients were subsequently included. And then, as I mentioned before, the primary analysis were for patients who had symptoms within three days, and the secondary analysis was for patients who had symptoms within five days. And the study recruitment occurred before Omicron. I think the other details of this study that are important to keep in mind is looking at the subgroup analysis. And I think when we look at that, um, we can see that the results were very promising, as we said. And so in the overall study population, there was a decrease um, in the percentage of events um, in the Paxlovid group. And so the overall difference from placebo relative to Paxlovid was minus 5.62 percent favoring Paxlovid, which resulted in a relative risk reduction of 89%. But I think it is really interesting to look at the subgroup analysis um, to see that in certain subgroups, uh, there were actually better results than the overall population. And so when we look at patients who were over 65, the difference uh, between Paxlovid and placebo was even more significant. It was minus 13.93%. Uh, when we look at patients who had BMIs that were greater than 30, the difference again was higher. It was 6.85%. And then when we look at patients who were serologically negative or antibody negative, the, the difference between Paxlovid and placebo was even larger. It was 10.25%. Um, just in, as importantly, I would also point out that in patients who were antibody positive or who received MABs, um, the effect between Paxlovid and placebo was not as pronounced. In fact, it's, it seemed like it was minimized. Again, looking at the subgroup analysis, I think the things to keep in mind that are important is patients who had a high viral load seem to have greater effects or greater benefit from Paxlovid. Um, we can see that patients who had a higher viral load, the, the difference between Paxlovid and placebo, again, was greater. It was 8.54%. Um, patients who had several comorbidities also seem to have greater benefit from Paxlovid. The difference, again, was 8.958%. And one interesting thing to, to just highlight, um, at least in the population that, that was studied in an Epic HR trial, there were no patients who had greater than or equal to four comorbidities. Again, looking at the subgroup analysis, um, another detail to point out is when we look specifically at patients who had only one risk factor, um, there were certain subgroups who may have a, a minimal benefit to Paxlovid or no benefit at all based on the confidence intervals. And so when we look specifically at patients who were cigarette smokers, uh, when we look at the confidence intervals specifically, we can see that the difference approaches zero, which would suggest that perhaps there is actually no benefit uh, again, when we look at diabetics, again, when we look at the confidence interval, again, we see that it approaches zero. And then specifically, when we look at patients who have chronic lung disease, the confidence interval crosses 0%, which would suggest there is actually no benefit for Paxlovid in patients with one comorbidity, one comorbidity of chronic lung disease. And so how do we use this paper? Or maybe the other way to think about it is, how is this paper and how is Paxlovid useful to us? And so I think the questions that we should ask ourselves first is, um, are the results that we see in this paper believable? Like, were these results good results? And so as I said before, 
one important thing to keep in mind is that Epic HR, all the lead authors were from Pfizer. There have been no independent studies so far to, to verify these results. However, I think the other thing to keep in mind is I do feel like Paxlovid um, and its pharmacologic mechanism of action is based on really solid science. And I think the inhibition of the conserved protease active binding site um, is really good science and it should work. Um, and we see that um, the trial definitely demonstrates what we theorize that Paxlovid has a antiviral effect and it reduces viral load by 10x. Um, in looking at the overall results as well as the subgroup analysis, the, uh, I would say the primary and secondary analysis as well as the subgroup analysis show that there is a overall significant benefit. And Paxlovid has very strong target selectivity. Um, I didn't show any slides on this, but there are actually very few side effects when compared to placebo. So I would say that the results of the paper show that Paxlovid is effective. But I think the question that we really have to ask ourselves is, can Paxlovid be used for the patients that we see here at MGH? And I think from what we've seen with the subgroup analysis, it would have benefit in many of the patients that we would see here at MGH. And specifically, when we look at the subgroup analysis, we can see that patients who have a BMI greater than or equal to 30, patients who have multiple comorbidities, patients who have high viral load and who are serologically negative show the greatest benefit to Paxlovid. The thing that we need to keep in mind is that even though this medication has a clear benefit in a certain high-risk population, there are many patients that need to be excluded um, from this medication, including patients who, are, who have significant renal and hepatic failure, uh, which are many of our patients, and most importantly, patients who are on medications that interact with the CYP3A4 cytochrome protein. And to think about how many patients that could be or how many medications that could be, let us look at all the medications. And there are actually four slides on this, which tell you uh, the challenge, I think, in ultimately using Paxlovid. And so th these are slides from um, the NIH, basically, giving recommendations on when to use Paxlovid. And this is, these medications are absolute contraindications to Paxlovid. And so this list includes any medications that we commonly see with our patients, um, anticonvulsants like carbamazepine, you know, barbitol, benitoin, uh, cardiovascular medicines like amiodarone, clopidogrel, uh, pulpary hypertension beds like sildenafil and miscellaneous medications like St. John's Wort. And then even medications that they would recommend holding, um, I think we would all feel fairly uncomfortable about holding many of these medications in the patients that we see. And when we look again at the list, it's, it's a, a list of medications for patients or a list of medications that we commonly see for our patients. So uh, rifaroxabad, uh, ranelzine, um, tapro, I would feel extremely uncomfortable holding these meds for our patients. And even reducing some of these meds, I would, I would also feel uncomfortable. So when we look at this list, apixaban, um, ketoconazole, cephalosporin, <laughs> seroquel, trazone, hydrocodone, oxycodone. And then finally, the list of medications which would require observation, again, would be a list of medications for patients uh, or a list of medications where we would see many of our patients on this list. So warfarin, vorconzol, glyburide, amlodipine, many of the antihypertensive meds that our patients are on. They almost took off all the blood pressure medications. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And so I think that ultimately that is the challenge of using Paxlovid.
So um, given the challenges of using Paxlovid, let's go back to this table. And again, think about what are our other options then? So I think we now have a better understanding of Paxlovid. Again, this is a protease inhibitor. Um, it has very good efficacy. Uh, the risk reduction is 89%. Uh, the number needed to treat is 18, which is quite good. Um, the pros, as we know, is that it has high bioavailability. And we theorize that this has been validated now in in vitro studies that it is effective across variants. And the main con, which is a very significant one, is that it has many drug to drug interactions. Our other option is remdesivir. As we know, this is a nucleoside analog. Um, its results were validated in pine tree, which again showed that the risk reduction was quite high, 87%. The number needed to treat was 22. I feel that at this point, this is the most validated of all these medications um, in multiple contexts. It has been studied in pregnancy. Uh, the main disadvantage is that it is an IV infusion that, that requires to get an infusion over three days. And then the other option is Satruvimab. Um, as we know, this is a monoclonal antibody. Um, its efficacy was validated in Comet Ice. Again, it, it's quite good. It has a risk reduction of 85% with a number needed to treat of 17. It has few to no drug interactions. Uh, the main concern is because of its mechanism, which is binding to the viral spike protein, um, there are concerns that it is not effective against variants, including uh, the Omicron B2 variant. And finally, uh, the other oral medication option is molnupiravir, um, or easier to pronounce, like radio. Um, so this is a nucleoside analog. Um, its efficacy was demonstrated in the move out trial. Um, its risk reduction is not as pronounced as the other medications. It is only 30%. Its number needed to treat is 31. Its pros is that it does have high, high bioavailability, but a significant concern is that it can induce mutagenicity. And that is related to its mechanism of action where it promotes mutations in the viral RNA. And so you can see how we we're all concerned that this would actually create a resistant virus. So um, when we are looking at the options that are available for outpatient treatment, I would say still the two best options would be Paxlovid, despite all of its limitations for drug to drug interactions, and Remdesivir, because it is by far the most well validated of all of the options that we, are, that we have seen. So I think the other important question to ask ourselves is, would this would Paxlovid be a medication that we would use for ourselves? Um, and I think the thing that we have to keep in mind is that the study was done in patients who were not vaccinated. And when we look at the subgroup analysis, um, specifically at patients who were serology positive or received MABs or monoclonal antibodies, it seems like the results were less effective, which would suggest for vaccinated patients, the Paxlovid effect may not be as significant. Um, in addition, when we look at the subgroup analysis for patients who had PMIs less than 25, um, Paxlovid was also less effective. Uh, when we look at Paxlovid for patients who had um, single comorbidities, it was less effective. And finally, when we look at Paxlovid for patients who had chronic lung disease, it is questionable whether or not it was effective at all. So, Going back to, to my original question, which is how is Paxlovid, how can we, how is it useful for us and our patients? Um, I think that Epic HR results are pretty convincing that Paxlovid is effective in the high risk population of a study for this trial. However, I would say I would use Paxlovid in outpatients with high risk comorbidities who are not taking medications that interact with ritinavir. And this dramatically limits its usefulness and would require a confident knowledge 
all of their medications or probably uh, the assistance of um, a very experienced pharmacist to look at those interactions. I would prefer remdesivir over Paxlovid for the early treatment of inpatients who have mild to moderate COVID-19, um, mainly because in the patients that we see here at MGH, they're going to be on, they're for sure going to be on one of the medications that interact with Paxlovid. Um, I would feel very uncomfortable about holding or dose reducing any of the medications that they need. And then finally, I would not use Paxlovid in healthy outpatients with no or one high risk comorbidity, especially since vaccinated ind individuals are unlikely to see significant benefits. And until we see the next trial, which is EPIC SR, which is the standard risk study group, um, I, would, I would sort of think about how uh, Paxlovid would be beneficial for a standard risk population. And so what other papers are um, in the pipeline that are studying Paxlovid? So not surprisingly, Pfizer is addressing the question that we probably all have on our minds, which is, is Paxlovid actually helpful to a vaccinated standard risk population? And so that study is called EPIC-SR. And actually, if we look at the Pfizer website, they have actually reported some of the interim results of EPIC-SR. And so SR stands for standard risk. Um, and it's, they basically looked at vaccinated individuals who are low risk for progression to hospitalization or death. And so their endpoints were actually slightly different from the EPIC HR study. And their primary endpoint was actually sustained alleviation of symptoms for four days. And per the Pfizer interim report, this endpoint was not met. Um, not surprisingly, their secondary endpoint, which was very, very similar to the EPIC HR study, which is uh, progression to hospitaliza hospitalization or death, they met that endpoint, although um, the risk reduction wasn't quite as great. I will say that um, the enrollment has not reached their target enrollment of yet. So, uh, these results may be incomplete, but at least at this point, the risk reduction is 70%. And so returning back to my title slide, uh, Paxlovid Romana, do I think that Paxlovid will lead to a lasting peace from the pandemic? And I would say, TBD, to be decided. And I actually think that there is one significant unanswered question that has not completely been addressed by the trials, which ultimately is whether or not Paxlovid reduces viral transmission in the HR and SR populations. And hopefully this will be something that Pfizer studies because if it can be proven to do so, I think it would be a huge game changer. Um, even if it is not capable of alleviating symptoms completely in the standard risk study, uh, the standard risk group, uh, if it is capable of reducing viral transmission um, in healthy people as well as people who are high risk, I think that would be a huge game changer and really change um, and really stop the pandemic. So hopefully that will be something that will be studied in the future. Um, hopefully, we'll see papers that will come out that will discuss that. So thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm very happy to see so many people here today. And I will turn it over to Ben and see if there are any questions uh, that we can discuss further. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Trorm. So uh, please feel free to put uh, questions into the chat. And our first question is, uh, and if you have uh, questions in the room, we're live streaming today on YouTube, but we can prioritize your questions if you have any burning questions. The first question from the chat is, can you comment on the adverse effects of Paxlovid? Um, so I briefly touched upon it in the slide that summarized um, the results from Epic HR, but basically what they found was that the side effects 
um, that occurred between Paxlovid and placebo occurred at a similar uh, uh, event or a similar event rate, which is about 22%. And the most common side effects, I think, were uh, dysquesia and diarrhea, but they were not felt to be significant adverse events, um, which again is consistent with the known mechanism for Paxlovid, which it has high target selectivity for the SARS-CoV protease, and there is not a human analog. So it should not be interacting with uh, human proteins and therefore hopefully should not be causing side effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the side of, in terms of the drug interactions, uh, the list is certainly impressive. We probably don't know yet which ones of them are clinically relevant, do we? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a difficult thing to answer since those patients were purposely excluded from the trial. So we don't know. Uh, we can only theorize based on what we know of retinavirus interaction with these medications that these would be significant side effects that should be, or significant drug interactions that should be avoided. Mm -hmm. um, and then for outpatients, um, given that two of the three medications that have su such similar relative risk and numbers needed to treat uh, IV medications, uh, is, is it still worthwhile to, to do one of the two IV medications? So Trovomab, I believe, is only a one-time dose IV infusion, uh, or should Paxlovid be considered even uh, if there are potential drug interactions Given it's given for uh, five days BID only. Yeah, I guess if if the question is, would I, if I if I could pick between Satruvimab and Paxlovid, which of those two would I pick? Um, if if the patient did not have drug interactions that interfered with Paxlovid, I would pick Paxlovid over Satruvimab, um, mainly because of the concern that Satruvimab may not be able to work in patients um, who have the Omicron variant, especially BA2. Um, and it seems like the CDC no longer recommends Satruvimab, at least currently, because of these concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And is Paxlovid an option for the home hospital program if patients meet all those criteria? Well, uh, I'm not <laughs> sure that I can answer that question. If we might have to ask Cindy that. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I would assume that it is. Um, but yeah, that, that is a good question that I'm not sure that I can answer. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, because home hospital, they can do IV injection, right? If, if you choose remdesivir, they can do it. Yeah, that's true. So that's very much like in the hospital. In hospital, we choose remdesivir over the uh, yeah, that's a good way to think of it. Um, I would probably prefer remdesivir. Mm -hmm. um, so Cindy says uh, Paxlovid is oral, and uh, can that be ordered by an outpatient? Um, so I guess you could always put in a prescription to a pharmacy for the patient to get the medication. Um, as an outpatient, um, I guess it's more of a statement. Uh, what other questions are there? Please feel, feel free to put them in the chat, or I think there's a question at the back of, at the, back of the room. So it sounds like with the HR population, like the study was done before Omicron. So is there a study in the works with the Omicron variant? Um, there's only an in vitro study that I'm aware of. And so the in vitro study basically looked to see if uh, Paxlovid uh, had any effect in, in neutralizing the Omicron variant in vitro, and it did. So um, at least in that study, um, its effect seems to be conserved across variants of Omicron. Um, and then uh, another question is with the SR population, um, it sounds like since fully vaccinated, is that including like, you know, the series and the booster, or is it like the second booster as well? Like, what are we considering? Do we know what we're considering fully vaccinated? 
Yeah, you know, we don't know. So nothing has been released. Um, I guess we could look at the clinical trials itself to see. I, I actually didn't look at the clinical trials like, to see what their um, inclusion criteria is for the population that we're looking at. But, but the only thing that's been, that was reported on the Pfizer side is that it, they did look at vaccinated patients, but they, they don't have a lot of details. Uh, they don't have very much in terms of the actual results or any subgroup analysis. So I think we have to wait for the paper to come out to understand what those results actually mean. Um, I read kind of very briefly off the like popular press that there's a phenomenon called breakdown COVID now after like the course of past COVID, where people just have recurrence of symptoms. And I think some people have actually looked at like the viral load and there's like a rebound of viral load as well. Um, do you know anything more about that? And if that's a concern? Um, I have heard about it. I don't know how I could explain it though. Yeah. Um, there's there's nothing about Paxlovid that I could think of that would cause viral resistance. Um, I mean, again, going back to its mechanism, yeah. it, it should be pretty effective at reducing viral load, but it, it is also something that I've heard about. Yeah. You mean second infection? No, it's like the same infection. So, you, you know, within three to five days, right, they take Paxlovid, and then at the end of the five-day course, they start having the same symptoms again. You know, like, oh, I, yeah. I don't know anything okay. about it, but I guess looking at, like, uh, viral titers, like, they go out to 14 days, and then, like, the study endpoints are 28 days, and so it's a step forward, like, yeah, like a concern. Like, I, I feel like there's objective data in the study that <laughs> So it gets some reassurance to I think it's pretty rare. It's not like our common thing, but sort of interesting. I mean, like Colbert was like sort of asserting it last week. It's probably, I mean, it's still working. It's preventing yeah. hospitalization and progression to severe illness. Um, just like hope it doesn't put it, put, you know, yeah. hesitancy into the population. Yeah, I'm taking part <laughs> <of them. laughs> Just curious, how often did the PCP use right? I've heard that it is not being used a lot because people aren't aware of it. Um, and that's, I mean, that's been one of the problems. I think the people are nervous about it. it does, so, like in the news, they said <clears throat> it's passed, and what, so it means CVS has that. Otherwise, you have a prescription. But when we go to the risk factors, and then with the medication therapy, I doubt many people qualify it or for PCP feel comfortable too, right? So that's why I'm curious. Have we heard anything from the PCP side? I call they really right. Well, I mean, we know that at least in the HR study, it is an HR group. And so, you know, most patients in your primary care panel are probably not HR patients. And so that's, that is why we have to wait for the results of the EPIC SR study. Um, I mean, it, at least in the results that have been released by Pfizer, it does seem like there will be similar results, at least for their secondary endpoint, which is, again, reduction in hospitalization and death. Like, like that, they definitely see uh, replicated in the, in the SR group. John? I was just wondering if anybody else is like, about viral load being like the, the focus of pathology. And just like the the order of magnitude of the viral loads that they report on vary by like a thousand or, or more than that. And so at, at like time zero. Um, and so like a tenfold reduction, I guess I was wondering It'd be nice to see who died because their titers were clearly higher initially. And then I feel like before people were vaccinated, people seemed to get the sickest after seven days of symptoms. I guess that was my like, anecdotal experience. And when you look at the viral loads, they're declining pretty quickly. And so it, it just seems like there's some pathophysiology that. Three days seems like 
three to five days seems like a long delay to something that like catastrophic. Uh, so I mean, I guess if you're if you're if one of the questions that you're posing is, you know, did they did they have any information about uh, the characteristics of the patients who passed away? And, and as far as I know, in the supplement they do not. I mean, it would be it would be really interesting to see what was different about that group and whether or not their viral loads were higher. Um, but we don't have that information. Mm -hmm. There was uh, one more comment about the MGH Home Hospital. And so they don't do Paxlovid at the moment. And they are working on getting remdesivir for COVID positive patients who require hospitalization. All right. I think that will do it for today. Thank you so much to Dr. Tron for this enlightening presentation. And see you next time. <laughs>